I know you're enjoying it. Let me welcome. We've already come together as campuses and church, uh, one church in many location of all of our campuses. Thanks for being there at one of our locations. Those watching online, maybe on demand during the week, uh, in spring breaks, you're watching it during the week. Then also, we just want every person to know that's at one of our correctional facilities. We love you. You matter to us, and we're thinking about you. Grant Smith, let's clap our hands for all those who are with us one more time. That's awesome. Love the study that we're in seven days, uh, which is the Passion Week. It's those days leading up to the death, burial, and resurrection of our Savior. I know reading each day, uh, I've just felt the weight of the journey of each of these days because it speaks to our life. And I'm just so thankful for Pastor Chris, who's brought us all together around this study, brought us into this place of these seven days. They are so significant, and every day and every moment, every step that our Savior takes, when you see His passion, it, 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 it lifts our passion. All of them are significant, and they're symbolic for our life. And uh, the study guide, make sure you get one of these. If you just maybe uh, are, are here for the first time or maybe hadn't been to church for a while, thanks a lot. But get, grab one of these. Jump in now. And these study guides will help you not only now throughout uh, the time we're together, but it helps you during the week. Gives you additional study opportunities. We can all learn together, grow some more. And then don't forget, Pastor Chris will be back here uh, next Sunday doing day four, and he'll be leading us in communion. You don't want to miss that. I love when Pastor Chris leads us in communion. Of course, diving into seven days, so he'll be with us. Don't miss it. And uh, our study began with day one, and that is the triumphant entry on that Sunday leading up, of course, all the way to the, the resurrection Sunday. And I love the title of that. I'm not going to let any stone or any rock cry out for me. I'm going to worship. Day two last week was Monday. And we talked a lot about stopping the chatter, uh, stop the traffic, stop the distraction, just give me Jesus. Today is day three, day three. That is the Tuesday of the Passion Week, and it is monumental in, in, in meaning for us in our lives and what's going on around us. And there's a couple of things that I think are so interesting, just some side notes. This is where a lot of the verses are at in the Passion Week. Well over 200 verses uh, take care of that day, happen during that day. And so that's going on. Uh, it's in all of the Gospels, all four Gospels. And then the other thing that takes place that is an important trigger for us to understand what's going on during that week, that last week, that final week of our Savior, is Judas now begins the process of talking to the chief priests and, and the religious leaders about betraying Jesus. So that has begun. The, the, the clock is now ticking as, as the players and all the props get ready for the cross and, 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 and the resurrection. All those things are taking place right there. And there are so many things that we could talk about. I mean, uh, you go in a lot of direction. Uh, there, there's, there's a lot of truths in day three on Tuesday that we could pick from. It almost feels like when you're downtown uh, Birmingham and you're, you're at that new kind of spaghetti junction and there's all these roads that go all these different ways. I mean, you can go up to Rocket City, come on Huntsville, you can go down to Titletown, you can go over, man, you, you go to Memphis from there. We can, we, we can go to the Gump. I mean, you can turn around and go back to Moody. Y'all you know what I'm talking about? We're the, the center of the universe in Moody, Alabama. And, I mean, there's, you can go from so many different directions right there and, in, and, and you could choose, and so it is a, it's a big, wide highway, and day three is a wide highway of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, where I really felt like the Holy Spirit directed in my heart is to, is to just stay in the lane of Matthew. And, and again, it encompasses a lot of verses, but I'm going to sum up these verses in three words, just three words that sum up all these verses all these windows, all these moments, and that's the three words, authority, assurance, and assignment. Authority, assurance, and assignment. As I read all these verses and all these moments, all this interaction, all the teaching of Jesus, I see these three words, authority, assurance, and assignment. And I want to teach a little bit. We'll pick out a few windows and I believe the Lord's going to help us. And right off the bat, Jesus has, has, has been to the temple the day before. He's cleansed the temple. Uh, the, the fig tree has withered. And he goes back on that Tuesday. He heads straight to the temple. He goes right back to the temple. And when he gets there, 
He is not met with, with, with a good mood. The religious elite are not happy. They're not happy about the day before. They're not happy about nothing. They never are. Can I have a good amen? <laughs> they ain't happy then, they ain't happy now. And, and so we dive right into Matthew chapter 21, one of those windows that you can see. Jesus entered the temple courts again Tuesday morning. And while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him and said, by what authority are you doing these things? We need to know what authority are you doing all these things, they asked him. Who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? He asked the, the leaders this. Where did John's baptism come from? Was it from heaven or human origin? Boy, you can see, boy, that, it just put them in a scramble. They discussed it among themselves and said, if we see from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't we believe in him? Mm. Uh, if we say human origin, then we're afraid of the people, for they all hold John as a prophet. <sighs> so they answered Jesus, we don't know. <laughs> then he said, neither will I tell you by what authority am I doing these things. Because he is the authority. He is the authority. There is no authority higher than the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. There comes a time in your life you have to wrestle with that. You have to grapple with that. Who's going to be the authority of my life? Who's going to be the authority of my heart? Something's going to be on the ch in charge. I used to have an old friend of mine who said, there's always, there's always somebody on the throne of your heart. You, have to, you get to determine who's going to be in authority. Now, what I love about this little window is uh, they are demanding answers. We demand answers. Jesus, give us answers. We demand a response. Jesus, you must give us a response. And I love how he does not give them an answer, but he gives them another question. I think sometimes when we study Scripture, we think about our Lord, we think that he's the answer man. Just, just giving out answers, giving out answers. But if you follow Scripture closely, Jesus, he will ask more questions than he gives answers. So often people are demanding an answer. I demand a response. And Jesus says, let me ask you a question. Why? Because he is the authority. And this goes on all day long. The whole Tuesday. The Pharisees who are just, you know, they're just the spiritual elites. They're like tyrants of, of rules. And then you got the Sadducees. What a name. Sad, you see, is what we should call them. Because they make everybody sad. So you got the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They're just a select group who are just guardians, and, and normally they're, 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 they're half specialists on everything. And this just goes on, on and on. You can see their insecurity in all of the, uh, everything. They go back and forth. They just go at him with debate and traps and complaints and words and arguments. And they have such callous hearts and they're manipulating and there's wrong motives. And, and they're, they're doing the blame game. They're the doubters and the downers and the fakers and the whiners. But Jesus, when you look at him closely, this goes on and on. All day long on day three. But when you look at Jesus closely among the fakers and the doubters and the complainers and the whiners, you see a Savior that is so strong and so patient. How can he be so patient and so strong when he's being so challenged and so misrepresented and there's so much complaining? How many knows there comes a time when you're nagged and you're nagged and you're nagged that, hey, that the water will boil over? He doesn't have to. You know why? Because he's the authority. He, he, he's the authority of it all. And you can see this, and he starts giving parables. So now the debate and the argument, he gives them parables because he's trying to give them, them, each of them, like everybody, a window into their heart. So he starts unpacking parable after parable, which the parables basically say there in Matthew 21, 22, 23, these things over and over again. The parables have this message. I love you. I've come to you. 
I've sent my prophets, I've, I've sent my messengers, and now I am here to free you, but you would not accept me. I'm knocking, I'm knocking, I'm knocking. Here I am. I've extended a great invitation. It's the whole parable of the wedding feast. Over and over again in Matthew 22, I'm here. I'm going to die for you. I'm inviting you. I'm calling you. Come on in. My father-in-law uh, I love going over to his house because if he knows we're coming over, he goes out into the driveway and waits on us. I love it. And when, and when we're driving down the road, like we're going to drive by, he waves us in. You know that person who opens up the door when you're going to see him? <laughs> Come on in. Now I'm going to stay in the yard. We're going to eat dinner out here in the yard. No, he just, he just waves us in. This, the, the, the teaching of Jesus really sums up in, in, in 21 and 22 and 23, and he's saying it to the hard hearts. He's saying, come on in. I'm inviting you. You can change. There can be freedom. I'm, I'm, I'm dying for you. I'm here for you. He said it then. Guess what? He says it now. He's waving us in now. That's what happens during worship. That's what happens when Pastor Chris preaches, when, when you feel the tug, when you feel the pull, when you're reading your Bible or you're digging into the study guide or you're sitting in a small group. What is the Lord doing? He's waving you in. Come. There's forgiveness. There's healing. There's a new beginning. There's a, there's a second chance. I'm waving you in. But in these windows, they would not. They couldn't get past themselves. They reject. We don't need you. We're obsessed with our territory and our self-truth. We've got to earn it. We've got to, we've got to do something. We don't want what you have. We're, we're going to do something. And what's so sad is you see the pictures of, uh, of these individuals that are debating with Jesus. Really, at the end of the day, they're just stubborn souls splitting spiritual hairs. That'd be nothing. It was then, and it's now. While Jesus is inviting, um, I went to Bible school, and I'll never forget my second year of Bible college. We, just like we have Highlands College, you do ministry. So I got excited on Saturdays. I would do uh, a, like bus ministry, or we would go into the community in some of our vulnerable, commu vulnerable communities where there were food shortage. And uh, on Saturdays, we would bring lunch because the, the, the kids in that neighborhood, they, they did, they had, there was a food, food shortage during the weekend. So we would pack peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. We would read coloring pages. And we would take our buses out. We would go have Bible study with the kids and feed peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and pray with them and be in that community. And so I was doing that. I signed up for that ministry. And I'll never forget one Saturday morning, uh, there were some guys who lived on the end of the hall. I didn't have a lot to do with them. They just were kind of on the other end of the hallway. I got up and I'm heading out in the morning. It's like 8 a.m. And one of them spots me. And he always called me the do-gooder. That was my name to him. Hey, do-gooder. I'll never forget. I'm heading to the, just, he says, hey, do-gooder. Hey, do-gooder, where are you going? I said, man, I'm going down, getting on a bus. I got some peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, some coloring sheets. I'm going to go love on some kids and reach some kids for Jesus. He said, huh. He said, listen, when you grow up, he's a big guy, but I was bigger. <laughs> just FYI. He said, hey, when you grow up, come down to this end of the hallway. He said, we're going to spend the day debating and going into the deep things of God. Have fun, do-gooder. I will never forget that day. I remember leaving there, and here's how I felt sm They made me feel small. Could I, to be honest, it made me feel dumb. It, it made me feel shallow. It made me feel less. And I'll never forget being out there that Saturday, pulling around a corner, reaching some kids, and a grandmother came out. She said, hey, can you take my six grandbabies with you? Can they go with you and enjoy the day? 
I don't know where the mom and daddy, they are. They're out on, running the streets on drugs. Can you take them with you? And I looked down, and there were six grand, grandbabies from ages 3 to 11. 3 to 11. And I brought them with me. And I spent my Saturday feeding peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and doing coloring sheets and praying with them. And I'll never forget going back to Bible college that day. And I thought about all that debating and, and, and all that deep things of God. I made a decision that day. I'd rather pass out peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and coloring sheets than to be down on the other end of that hallway doing the deep debate things of God. Guess what? I'd still rather be doing it. Why is it? That self-righteous people complicate and clutter the message of Jesus Christ. That's why I love this church. That's why I love Highlands. I love it because it's just the accurate, simple, clear message of Jesus Christ. Every campus. I love, I love how our pastor preaches. It gives people opportunity. Let's people take a step. Church is, not, church is not supposed to be a maze. This is awesome. I don't know where I'm at. I love Christianity. I'm so confused. So I love our pastor. So I love our church. That's why I love that Easter is right around the corner. Because the message is so clear through the worship. And Pastor Chris preaches the message, the clear gospel of Jesus Christ. And all kinds of people will say yes to him. That's why I love leading up to Easter just a few weeks away, that I can be an inviter and a bringer. And because and I, I have so many services, and then I can do acts of kindness, because I know that in those moments that the authority of Jesus is going to be presented, and all kinds of people are going to say yes to Jesus. That's what I want to give my life to, give my life for. I love these, these chapters, I love these windows where Jesus gives us authority, assurance, and assignment. I, I'm, I'm going to bring it home a little bit. Uh, we, we, we head into Matthew 24 and 25. That's at the latter part of day three. And he said his authority, there's, he has the authority. Everyone has been silenced. And now he's going to wrap it up and, and it's going to come to an end and he's going to start talking about the end times. Going to start talking about how this thing's going to wrap up. And, and the disciples immediately hear end times wrap up, and they immediately think, how are we going to make it? Oh, boy, how are we going to make it? How, how are we going to handle all these things? What's, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? And he tells his team, hey, it's going to be okay. And, and you can see this, this comfort and this authority and this assurance that he gives them just a few windows uh, in this conversation. You can see it as we wrap up. Uh, Matthew 23, as he's leaving Jerusalem, he says, see, get a glimpse of his heart. It's amazing. This is incredible, incredible. He says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who will kill the prophets and stone those who sent you. How often I've longed to gather your children together. As hens gather her chicks under her wings, you were not willing. Look, your house is left desolate, but I tell you, you will, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. I got this. You look to me, you're going to be okay, because I'm going to gather you. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to take care of you. That's what my heart is. That's what I want to do. I want to do those things. And then he goes right into Matthew 24, verse 1. And Jesus went out, departed to the temple. The disciples came up. They showed him the temple. Jesus said, do you see these things? And surely I say to you, not one stone shall be left upon another. I shall not be thrown down. He says, there's some things that are going to happen. And they sat together on the Mount of Olives. The disciples came to him and they said, what's going to, look what they say. Tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming of the end of the age. And Jesus just unpacks it. He says, it's going to be okay. And he begins with his authority to give them the assurance, no matter what happens, it's going to be okay. You can see this. He, he takes it all the way down into Matthew 24. I love this passage of Scripture about the end times. Then he describes it. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, 
and will hate one another. He's describing the world, what's going what's to happen, things that are going to go on. Then many false prophets will rise up, deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. It says the love, love will all of a sudden be, will start decreasing, and, and people that love will all of a sudden start hating, and there'll be, there'll be all these distractions, and all these things are going to go. He tells his disciples, this is what's going to happen. But he's sitting there in that Olivet Discourse uh, on, on the Mount of Olives, and he's just sharing these final thoughts, and he says to them, he says, but remember, he who endures to the end shall be saved, and this gospel of the kingdom, it will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. How does he know that? He's the authority. Did you know that Jesus is the authority of the end times? He's the authority. So it's the one that's the authority that gives us the assurance that I got this. And in this verse, we find assurance for everything happening in the world. I don't know if there's a greater verse for me when I look at what's going on in the world today and the current events and everything happening that gives me more assurance than that verse. I mean, it's right there. It's factual. He gives certainties. They're absolutes. The core assurances. There's three of them. I'm going to give them to you. I'm going to give you three assurances. Since he's the authority, then you and I can have a sure. What's going to go on? What about the end of the age? What about Putin? Putin! COVID! There's an assurance. There is an authority. There's somebody in charge of the whole thing. And he gives us these assurances. I want to get, and I wrote this in my notes. These are big for the Christ follower right now. Because as a Christ follower, you you don't want to be confused. We can't operate in fear. We don't need to be, we don't need to live worried about the future. We need to live under the authority of Jesus and in the assurance of his word. There's three of them right here. Here's the first one: an assurance of victory. He says, there'll be a victory. Keep your faith and you will be saved. Don't lose faith. It's not the smartest who are going to make it. It's not the most spiritual who are going to make it. But 100% of 100% of those who endure will be okay. And, And you know what I've learned? That endurance is not a feeling. Endurance is a decision. I'm going to endure. If you study that Greek word endure, it actually means to grab something with your claws. It's not like I'm enduring. It's not casual. It's not convenient. Well, you know, church is just a part of something I do. My Bible is just a good suggestion. I just visit. No, no, no. To endure, which is an assurance of victory, those who endure will be assured victory. It's like claws. Come here. Nope. I need you to come here. Okay. I, I'm, I'm literally, I'm, I've grabbed hold, and I'm not letting go. I don't care what they say. I don't care who does what. I don't know what's happening in the world, but I'm enduring in my faith. Because I have an assurance that if I endure, I'm going to be okay. Because I'm up under the authority of Jesus. Hey, guess what? Jesus is the authority of the end times, and he gives us an assurance that we'll be okay. Oh, that's, that helps somebody deal with fear and deal with uncertainty. It's an assurance of victory. It's an assurance of mission. There's a mission. You know what the mission is? The gospel will be preached. It's going to be preached. It's not going to be stopped. It's not going to be shut down. The gospel will not be silenced. The gospel will be preached. Assurance of victory, assurance of mission, and watch this, assurance of completion. You know what the completion is? He said it right here. 
the end will come. That's it. End's going to come. You're good. It's okay if the end comes because God is in control. If he's the authority, I'm good. He is the authority. We have assurance. And guess what? He ends day three with the assignment. It's amazing. He ends it with a story about our assignment. He says, make sure, make sure you're about my assignment. Find yourself in my work. Find yourself in my field. Find yourself in my space. Find yourself in my assignment. Don't be in the stands. Don't be spectating. Don't be fault finding or backseat driving. Don't be the critic. Don't be the onlooker. Be about my assignment. Matthew 25, 35 through 46. I'll read a few of them. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger. You took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was imprisoned, and you came to me. I love the response. Then the righteous will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and give you food? Or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you as a stranger and take you in? I don't remember naked and clothe you. Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king, the king will answer and say, Surely I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. What's our assignment? Love the least. That's the assignment. Because Jesus says, how you treat the least is how you treat me. Right. We're the same. Right. He's the authority. He gives us an assurance. Therefore, I'm going to be busy doing his assignment. Yeah. I will leave the rest up to the king. Amen. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? I'm scared. I'm scared. Who's your authority? Do you have an assurance? Why don't busy yourself with the assignment? He'll handle the rest. He'll handle the rest. Uh, when I was growing up, uh, I was not a great athlete. Later in life, I became an elite athlete. And was, 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 was. But in my young years, I was still kind of, uh, you know, struggling. But I had some skill when it comes to the game of Nerf football. Could be a Hall of Famer. And uh, so we played Nerf football in my front yard, and we played with these brothers down the street. It was me and some kids that just barely could play. And, and, but these six brothers down the street were athletes. I mean, they were athletes. And, you know, they come down there, let's play. And it's two or three times a week for, you know, a couple of years we play. We get beat. Man, they sack us. Couldn't even take a snap. Terrified. Couldn't go out on a route. We're getting beat, man. They were skilled athletes. We're getting, you know, we're, we're, we're double teamed. We're getting overwhelmed. We're defeated. We're so defeated. We were terrified. Just, <gasps> but then midway through the game, We'd see the station wagon coming down the road, Burnley Road. And that was Dana Ray's station wagon. Dana was, Dana was an athlete. Dana parked that station wagon. Dana went on to play basketball at NC State. Dana was an athlete. Girl, boy, she could, she'd, come to, she'd come running down there, got the athlete. You know the athletic walk. What's up? What's up? And she'd always say, who's winning? Duh. Look at us. Look at them. She said, okay, great. She'd come in the hut. Okay, I'm going to play with this. She said, listen, I'm going to be all-time quarterback. Right, Ooh, Dana Ray. Man, there's something about Dana Ray being in our huddle just changed things. Because she was an athlete. She had some authority on that field. And she brought some assurance in our little backwards huddle. Man, you go out this way, go here, hitting us with passes, running. She running the ball, like with nerf in her hands. We scoring, we scoring. It's amazing. Everything changed when Dana Ray got on the field. Yeah. 
Man, we'd win. Hey, same kids, same Nerf football, same, same team, different quarterback, different presence on the field. Oh, let me tell you something right now. I don't know what's going to happen in the world. I'm not sure all the double team and all the sacks and all the pain and all the challenges, but I'm going to tell you right now, we got a quarterback who has authority that gives us an assurance, and if we'll be about his assignment, everything will change. Oh, he is with us. Come on over. Come on over. It's going to be okay. Church, it's going to be okay. We have an authority. He has a plan. We have assurance. Let's go be about his assignment. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Let's pray together. Father. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that you are the authority of this this field. You know exactly what's going on. Nothing surprises you. Nothing has caught you off guard. So we submit our lives under your authority. And and it's okay. We're good with saying, hey, we're not in control, but you are. So, Father, we lean into you right now. Maybe you're here now. You've been scared, worried. So much going on. You feel like you've been double teamed. I'm going to ask our campus pastors to join me on stage. I want to give you an opportunity to invite the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He's the real authority. He's the real authority. It's not all this other stuff. He's the authority. And he gives us an assurance that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Change my assignment, Lord. I'm about to start living for you. All across this room, with every head bowed, every eye closed, I'm not going to have you stand or come forward, but at every campus, those watching, if you're here, you say, Dino, I need to give my life to Jesus Christ. If that's you, would you slip up your hand? Hands are going up all across Grant's Mill right now. Boy, I feel the Holy Spirit speaking to someone right now. Say, be assured. Be assured. Put your life in my hands. Trust in me. Trust in Jesus. You put that hand down. Let's pray this prayer right from our heart. Maybe you didn't even raise your hand. But you know in your heart you're not ready. You're not ready. Invite Jesus to be Lord of your life. Pray pray a prayer like this out of your heart. Say, dear Jesus, I accept that you died. I believe that you died for my sins. And I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I confess you as my Lord, my Savior, my authority, and my assurance. I give you my life. Give me a new beginning and give me a fresh start. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's clap our hands for all those who made a decision.